Good day everyone and a warm welcome. It's great that you can join us for today's webinar. It's the next Shadow Match system webinar and today's topic is employee development. We trust that you will find the topic insightful. And for those of you joining for the first time, I did see a few new names, welcome. Uh, just a few administrative arrangements. Your microphone is currently in the mute setting. Um, it will remain like that for the duration of the webinar. You're welcome to use the chat to post questions. I will present the questions to Peter at the end of the webinar. And we will also allow you to ask your questions live once the presentation is done. So you will then have the opportunity to unmute your microphone and ask your questions. No further announcements from me. Thank you very much, Peter, over to you. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Lizette, welcome. Um, let's start immediately with the topic. If we don't, then we might not get through all the content and uh, the framework and the outline of what we need to discuss. Uh, when we talk about employee development, obviously we talk about something that might be very vague and um, a little bit remote and a little bit far away from, from the core business uh, essentials of a company, but it is on the level of employee development that many companies fall behind in the in the race uh, of competition and, and, and to stay in line with, uh, with the competitive edge that they might have had or they might hold uh, in the market. Uh, it's something that obviously in a, in a fast changing world becomes increasingly important because as the world changes, people do not follow the changes naturally. It's not something people do. It's, you, have, you have it here and there, an individual that follows the patterns of change over time uh, a, a very, in, a, in, a, in a very assertive manner and say, but I want to stay with this. Uh, some of the research that has been done by the mobile phone industry have shown that for, for most of the changes that they make to the technology, they're wasting their time. They must just change the look and feel of the outside of the phone, and that has more value to users and it attracts more users than some of the functional developments that they spend billions of dollars on uh, to make life. I just read an article on one of the major uh, mobile phone uh, suppliers where they found that people buy the phones or they upgrade or they get new phones, not for the functional capabilities of the phone, but for the, for the camera, um, if there's an upgrade in the camera and for, for the look and feel of the phone, the size of the phone, um, how it presents, the colors that are available. And the reason for that is simply um, embedded in our inability to capture the minds of people to stay with changes and new developments in the world. What then happens is at a point we fall behind and there's a learning gap in the employee base of a company. Another problem is that for those people who are on an aggressive development path within themselves, they don't stay with the companies who do not develop and co-develop with them and help them to develop. They move to more progressive companies. The result is you start to lose your best uh, minds in the business. And then you stay, we, who stays behind are those individuals who do not have the natural capability to make progress in their own self-development. And, and obviously then when you lose the, the progressive minds in the company and you only remain those who would like to stay with what, what they know and what they can do, um, then, then you fall behind in the in the rat race of competition and making, making progress with your company. So there are four areas. Let's have a look at the screen. There are four my prime areas or primary areas where people need to, where employers, companies must develop and focus on the development of their people. We will discuss these four. It is knowledge development, skills development, behavior development, and performance development. So these are the four areas. There are other areas as well. I understand that, but these are the four key areas where development needs to uh, take place. 
I will go through them and, and, and show you how it must and can be done and what the possibilities are um, as we make progress through these four areas. If we talk about knowledge-based development in terms of the learning content, we train people. We must understand that knowledge is a function of memory. We remember things. And because we remember certain things, um, we have the ability to then answer questions about it, to, to share information and to uh, convey information to others and, and to transfer information to others. But there are some challenges in the world of knowledge-based training, and I'll show you what the research indicates. Knowing um, is, is one of the constructs that are critical for every job. Every job we do requires an, a level of knowledge. It doesn't matter what we do. It doesn't matter how um, entry level the job is. It might be something that is for a very entry level person just entering the, the workplace from high school, uh, or even those who haven't completed their high school uh, qualifications. It could be a very, very easy job. You still require a level, a level of knowledge. Some um, of the knowledge um, content is very easy to transfer. You show the person how it's been done, explain a bit, and then they understand and they can do it. Obviously, there are also limitations to that. The problem in the more advanced jobs is called Google. And now, despite the amazing value of systems such as Google, and there are others as well, it has compromised the working knowledge of many employees. And the reason for this is there's a mindset and it has developed a very, very aggressively over the, the, the last five to 10 years where people say, but I don't have to know this. I can Google it. And it starts with students at high school and students at universities and colleges saying that I don't have to write an exam, an exam about the history of, 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 of the development of engineering. I can Google this. Whenever I need the knowledge, I can Google it. This is a problem because in some situations, you can't Google it and you don't have the time to Google it. There are some jobs where I can Google it, just doesn't work. There are, there are constraints. Let's take, for instance, an emergency rescue team. If they run into a, a situation where there's somebody with, with a serious, who has been in a car accident and some serious injuries, they cannot Google how to use some of the equipment that they have available. There's no time. They have, there must be a working knowledge for the work that some, that, that we do. And the, I can Google it culture has a compromising impact on the knowledge that people hold about their jobs. Then the third thing that we must remember is that knowledge is gained through training and learning. People must learn things. In this, we have obviously classroom training um, where people uh, go through a lecturing process and then they might, might even read their notes again or read a, a book or read some content and they might write an exam. Uh, it's all good and well. The fact is that after 10 weeks, only 10% of what has been taught is still part of our working knowledge. The decline and the loss of information as a result of classroom training is huge. So we have to train a lot to retain the base level of knowledge. And, and the base level, if we only tr uh, train the 10% that we see as the base level of knowledge for the job, we only retain 10% of that 10%. So we must always fill the, the, the trainee, the people that we train with much more information that, than, than what we need critical for the job. And this is obviously an expensive exercise time consuming and the losses of, 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 of knowledge uh, makes it very difficult for us to retain the knowledge for the workplace that, that most jobs need. 
it contributes very little to workplace success. This is something that we must just keep in mind. Uh, the knowledge necessary for a job is not in most jobs. There are some jobs that are different, but in many jobs, the knowledge that we need for the work that we have to do is much more limited than what we anticipate. I once did a bit of a study uh, amongst professional people, and uh, I did a small questionnaire. It was about 15 years ago. Ask them, Hum, what percentage of your knowledge? And these are professional people. It's not, it's not a, a, a sort of an admin clerk or a, somebody working in a restaurant or something like that. It, these are highly qualified people. They spent a minimum of seven years at university to qualify. And I've asked them, what percentage of the learning content that you have gained from your years studying at university, are you still using one year after you have been in the professional practice of your job? And the most of them said about 10 to 20 percent. So we have, but we have to train that much to retain what is critical for the job. Of all the development we can do as employers, when we have an employer hat on, uh, the knowledge faculties that we need to increase is of least valuable. There are some critical things. Yes, I understand it. Let's say, for instance, the IT system that's being used is being replaced by a new IT system or uh, the technology that we use is being replaced by new technology. Yes, there must be training must be done. I understand it's, that that is being, um, that, that's a fact uh, and everybody knows that. But the fact that we have to train people to gain more knowledge about their work is in most instances not the critical area where training needs to take place and development of people needs to try, take place. Training is not the key area. We must be careful though. In some jobs, it is absolutely critical. So although in a lot of the work that people do and a lot of the careers that people follow, the knowledge, the ongoing knowledge, the ability to know things and to be taught and trained is not the most critical for sustained success in the workplace. It is important. It is of huge value, but it's, it is not the most critical aspect of the, the, the success that they might have in their careers. Let's have a look at uh, this. There's although we must, I must just uh, fold in this. Um, there is a catch in, in the training and learning faculties of people and the constructs of learning. And this is something that I sort of had a feeling that this might be a problem. And then I started to do research and read a bit. And I came across some information that really made me think long and hard. Globally, on a global scale, reading, the ability to read and the behavior of reading, in other words, active reading, is in sharp decline. There's a decline in the reading time people spend. And they, there's, there's a lot of research that's been done, especially on university level. A lot of research has been done. And we were of the idea that people actually read more because they read um, on social media, they, they read short messages from, and they write more because they write short messages. It's, it's a problem because the reading on social media is very short sentence based. It's up to five or six word sentences. And uh, the marketing and advertising industry has uh, uh, realized that if they push four, five, six word sentences, people tend to read that. So what, what we lose is the ability to read complicated stuff and long sentences. Uh, and understand what the sentence uh, tells us. So reading is in decline, but there are four categories. People who can read, people who can read, but they don't read unless they have to. They have the ability to read, but they don't read. 
either they don't want to or they only read if they are forced to. People who read efficiently with understanding and memory. That's category number or group number, number three. And then people who lost their ability to read. They can read words only. This is quite important to understand. And that is that over a period of time, people can still read words. One or two, three, but the moment it's a sentence, they can't read it anymore because they, they are not conceptually fit enough to hold all the content of the reading line or the idea that that's being conveyed to them and being uh, communicated to them. They can't hold the different patches of the reading content together. And they could start with a small paragraph. And when they are at the end of the paragraph, they have zero idea of what they have read. They've got to read it again and again. And then sometimes it goes as far as they have to break it up in key words to really get their minds around what is being communicated in the paragraph. And then number four, people who lost their ability to read. They can read obviously words only. And as I said, these are driven by, by marketing initiatives and social media that creates that, that scenario. So if we look at these four categories and we look at the decline in reading on a global level, what we see is that people who can't read, this remains stable in undeveloped countries. They represent around 12% of global population, but that is, that is, they don't have the ability to read. So they are adults, but they can't read. They, they, they can talk, uh, they can communicate with one another uh, on a verbal level, but they cannot read. They don't have the, they don't have the ability to read a word. But then number two, three, and four, there's an interesting pattern amongst these three uh, categories, number two, three, and four. Number three is in decline. Let's have a look what number three is. This is where we want people and students uh, and employees to be. People who read efficiently with understanding and memory. This is what we want. We want people at university and obviously in the workplace who can read efficiently and uh, with understanding and memory. Now, I wanna say something about this. We sent obviously the shadow match reports and the emails that's been sent by the system. We receive many requests from clients who said, I don't know how to do this. And then what we can't understand is, but we've sent an email, the system has sent an email that outlines how to do this very clearly. And then when I started to do this research, I realized that it's not, it's not that people can't read. It's not that people don't read. They can't read. They don't have the ability to take the information that they have received in the sentences of an email and transfer that into working capabilities of knowledge within their own um, uh, understanding of what must be done. So this is what we want. We want people who read efficiently with understanding of memory. Now, I just wanna make another comment that you might find, find interesting. This is something that we blame the individual for. We, we must be very careful to be not too hard on this because if we take a pamphlet of 20 years ago on how to set up a a television set or how to start your mobile phone or how to uh, uh, get up and running with, with, with any new appliance that you have purchased. It is something that you have to read. If you buy one now, there are five pictures or six pictures. The one is plug in this, number two, do that. It's all picture based. And over time, what we have done is we have unlearned the ability to read uh, complicated content and challenging content. Then number two and number four, those two. Number two, people who can read, but they don't read unless they have to. And people who lost their ability to read, they can read words only. So they can't put sentences together. It is anticipated that number three will decline to below 10%. That 
what we want will decline to be below 10% of the global population by the year 2050. Number two and number four, these two, those two are increasing. The number of people as a percentage of global population that sits in these two areas, in these two categories, number two, I can read, but I don't want to, or I, I read if, only if I have to. I have a resistance against reading, despite the fact that I can read. And number four is also on, on the increase. So we have an increase in people who either resist the activity of reading, and we have a decline in the people who read with understanding and memory. Now, obviously, the question that we must answer and the question that most probably all of us um, ask is, but we, how do we get people to read? We can't. We cannot change this scenario on a global level. We can change it with, I can change it with my children, for instance. Um, but, but there are 100 million children that must learn to read. I can't change their lives. And it's a global uh, sort of a culture that, that is in the process of unfolding. What we must do is we must change the way we transfer content to people. And a lot of work is currently being done on this. My personal problem with this is we transfer content to people with short videos and, 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 and short picture messages, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But that actually then makes this problem grow. So we then teach people to look at pictures instead of reading. Um, and, and that's why I'm saying, and that's why my position currently is, I don't know what to do because this is a challenge that we will have to address going forward in life. Um, and, and, and I'm not sure how to do it, to, to teach people to read and to read voluntarily. So let's have a look at the next thing, skills development. On a skills development level, what we talk about is the ability to physically and uh, smoothly and successfully execute a task. A, skill, a skilled person can do things in a smooth, physical things in a smooth and successful and efficient manner. So a skill also relates to the physical ability to do things. And we might, we might think about, let's say, uh, a nurse. The skill to handle a patient, uh, to do an in injection, to handle some of the technology, to take blood pressure, these things are skills. Yes, there's a baseline of knowledge related to this, but there are skills involved. And we can, we can list how to work with, a, with, with, with software, how to work with a computer, how to work with technology in the workplace, how to put technology together. Um, these are all skills. It's a physical ability that we need. Uh, and there are some of the things that we think about as knowledge-based, uh, but we easily forget that it is actually more of a skill than a knowledge capability. Like, for instance, um, being a good coach. Being a good coach is a skill. To listen to what people say is a skill. Um, to, to, to communicate in a way that, that makes people do things is a skill. Leadership is a skill. Yes, I, I completely support the idea that it's being supported and based on levels of knowledge. But when you start to execute the task, when you do the thing, then we talk about skills development. It's, a, it's acquired through physical repetition. You learn to swim by swimming, and that's the baseline. You learn to deal with conflict by dealing with conflict. You learn to put technology together by putting technology together. And this is it. You acquire a skill through the process of physical repetition. It is a critical contributor to productivity in the workplace. Let me give you an example. To draft an email is a skill. Um, I'm fully aware of the fact that you need certain knowledge capabilities and certain levels of knowledge about the language and, and, and. 
But to draft a professional email is a skill. It's something that must be done physically in such a way that it says what you want to say. I've been, I've, I've, I read lots of emails and sometimes I read an email and I say to myself, um, I don't know what this person wants to say. Uh, because some way there's a gap, either in the skill of, of, of writing, because writing is a skill, or in the knowledge that the person has about the language in use. So there are lots of skills that we use every day that we do not always see as a skill. We think it's just something that we do naturally. It's not. It's, been, it's, a, it's, a, it's an ability that's been acquired through physical repetition. Skills are much more of a long-term investment compared to training. This is an important note um, to make because skills, be uh, based on the fact that we acquire the ability through physical repetition of an ac action or an activity, it sits in the brain, in the neurons of the brain, in a much more long-term frame than just knowledge. If we hear or we read uh, something and, and, and we write an exam, even if we write an exam about something, the retention of knowledge is low, whilst with skills, when we have acquired the ability through the repetition, physical repetition of an action, the long-term um, uh, hold on to the capability is much more effective than when we only train people and when we read and share knowledge with people. It has more long-term value in productivity and workplace success. This is, a, this is an important investment to make in the people that work with us and for, big, uh, for companies, big or small. We must put a lot of time and effort in the development of their skills. That is through physical repetition. And it's, this, is, this is, in most instances, mentorship and coach-based development. It's not, it's not classroom. The moment we say to people, okay, let's do this. We are in the skills development framework. If we teach them, if we share knowledge with them, we train them. The moment they do something, they are then in the skills frame, skills development framework of development. So if we look at behavior, this is, um, now we start to touch some of the most critical parts of, of, of employee development. This is, uh, it's, it's by far the most critical component for success in the workplace. There's no, there's no question about this. If we do not have the behavior and the habits that fit the demands of the workplace, uh, we can have the skills, we can have the knowledge. If the work doesn't and the workplace doesn't work for me, I cannot be successful and I might even quit my job. Despite the fact that I have the knowledge, I'm qualified and despite the fact that I have the skills. Long-term success in a career is without doubt 80% dependent on the behavior patterns or habits of the individual and the seamless integration of behavior and, and the context slash the demands of the workplace. There's no, there's no question about this. Long-term success is, is, the, is most dependent on the fact that my behavioral patterns work and they integrate and they, 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 there's a seamless match between my habits and the job and the workplace, the working environment, and that makes me that that makes me successful. And it also makes me stay with that workplace. And, and I, there's a higher retention of skills and talent and knowledge if we have a good match between the individual's natural habits and the demands of the workplace. In the behavior of an employee, uh, of in the behavior. Of an, if the behavior of the employee and the workplace don't match, these are the five things that you can bank on as a result. Your workforce will become frustrated. People will have frustrations that they, then they start to manage the frustrations instead of managing their jobs. There will be poor performance. The number of poor performing people in the workplace 
will be more than the number of, of, of good and top performers in the workplace, which is a very costly uh, scenario to deal with. There will be conflict between people and the workplace and people and their, their employees, because when we become frustrated, obviously, we become irritated with one another and then conflict starts to develop. Resignations, I just had a conversation, very interesting conversation. Uh, with somebody who is with a big global organization. And this is being said to be the, the number one challenge. And that is that their best people resign. And their best people, they qualify their best people are those with the most skilled people, the best qualified people, most knowledgeable people about the work that they have to, de to do. Uh, and they, 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 they get them in, they recruit them at a high cost. They go, go through the process of, of, of getting them on board in the business and then they resign. It's a huge cost for the business. The problem is obviously they recruit the wrong people. Um, so the resignations are some of the most important strategic uh, challenges that they have as a company. Then there's a negative influence on college, uh, on the colleagues that we have around us. And then the result of this is negative culture patches develop in the business. And this is obviously very, very, very energy consuming. It doesn't, it doesn't serve the business well. So um, it's not a good thing to have that. Then performance development, number four on our list of, of development components that we need to address is that um, of, of performance development, how do we get people to perform optimally in the workplace? And I must just say something between brackets. We do not have, we, all people do not have the ability to perform at the same level in the workplace. That's, that's just a fact. Some people can work 20 hours a day for six weeks if they have to deadline. Some people just can't do it. They, and they just refuse to do it. Whether they can do it or not, they just don't do it. Uh, and the reasons behind it is, 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 is not really important. They, they, they just can't do it or they just won't do it. What we have found, and I have done more than 80 analysis of companies through another system that we have called Next Move 4.0. And what we have found statistically is that performance management in most companies is not done properly or it is not done at all. And if it's done, it's done in a very negative way. That is the number one challenge that we have found uh, through this process is that performance management is a challenge that, that the most, of, most of the companies that we have, that I have done an assessment for in terms of the design capabilities in the business and design functions uh, fall short on the performance development and performance management challenges of, 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 of building a solid business. So what must be done, obviously, is that the recruitment must be solid. We cannot recruit the wrong person for the job and then performance them to be the right person, performance management them to so that they become the right person for the job. It doesn't, you can't do that. You cannot recruit somebody that will not be able and will not fit the working environment because of all the reasons that we have just mentioned. And then we say that uh, we will have a performance management practice in place uh, to, to, to get them to top performer uh, um, uh, level uh, through, the, through a performance management process. It, it just doesn't. What you, what you do is you get the wrong person and you start with performance management, they resign. So they, they, they walk away. Top performance must be acknowledged. This is where we, we have a challenge in the business environment of acknowledging top performance. People resign because they experience that their hard work is not being acknowledged. They work much harder than other people. They have much better results than other people, but there's, not, there's, there's, there's nothing in it for them. Uh, it's, it's, it goes unseen. And this is a huge challenge in, in, in companies, obviously, and there are, many, there are many side challenges to this, which I don't want to go into much detail, but it's not being done. And the fact that it's not being done uh, creates negative energy in the business and people start to resign because they feel that they, they work very hard for nothing. 
Then the culture that we must build in a business is that people must work for the business and not for a person. What we do in performance management is we have a good team leader or a good manager or a good senior uh, manager, and people then start to work for that good manager. So they serve a person. The, the manager resigns and the performance of the team is then compromised. Now, this is a huge challenge in business. People, we must build a culture of people working for the success of the business. And that is the platform for their own success. They must not work for the, to satisfy a manager or a person or to, to do what they anticipate that person want from them. They must do what the business needs. And to, to split these two aspects of performance management is for many companies just a bridge to fall. They don't know how to do it. So there are certain things on a leadership level that must be done in order to come to this place and this position where people work for the business and not for a person. Then poor performance performers in the business must be coached uh, to improve performance, to assess job fit, to redirect their careers, and if all of the above fails, to find an alternative in a positive way. So I will show you in the next in the in the next uh, set of notes that the performance management practices have very negative leftovers if it's done improperly. If a manager starts with hard performance management and build up a culture of being a hard manager that forces people to perform and to deliver what is what they are told to deliver, uh, obviously they those managers in, in modern times, they just chase people away. So poor performers, we must do something with poor performers. What, what, must, what many companies, especially companies with lots of money do with a poor performance is they, they appoint something somebody else to do the job and then they appoint a manager to manage those two who are now both poor performers so that the manager can see that they do the job and then if that doesn't work they appoint another person and they appoint a senior manager to manage the manager so that the manager can see that the three people can now do the job that should have been done in this, uh, in, in in all respect with all respect by one person so, so we, we work around the problem, we don't work with the problem, but performance management must improve performance. We must assess whether this person is the right person for this job. Is there a good job fit for this person? We must redirect their careers. This is not a, a salesperson. Then try to find somewhere else in the business that this pe person might be a good fit so that their performance uh, in, that, in that alternative position can be more successful. And if that doesn't, doesn't work, then we have to find an alternative for the individual so that they can exit the business in a positive way because it doesn't work. We, uh, companies can't pay people who don't perform. So in the performance development area, we must keep in mind the fact that there is a shift in the way performance is managed. This is now one of the most, most recent um, discoveries that we have made, and that is that the hard manager to subordinate performance management is, is progressively and increasingly being replaced by coaching-based performance management and practices. Now, let me just share with you this hard manager subordinate performance management. That sentence, that line creates in the, in the modern world and in the future world of work, a lot of negative energy in the workplace. It doesn't work. Hard managers just, it doesn't work anymore. We must take a different approach. The world has changed. The way in which people see their careers and jobs have changed. And the fact that people can move from the one employer to the next makes it almost impossible to be hard on them and expect them to stay and to remain in their, in their jobs. They, they leave. I've just sat with somebody very recently in a critical position of a major big company, global company, and she got frustrated with her manager. 
and she resigned. And they had to come back to her and say, please, please, what do you want us to do? And then she said, but this person is bullying me. He's doing this and this and this. And it seems like that person, that senior person, is now on the verge of losing his job because he, have, he has improperly managed somebody who is his junior and he's done a few things that she didn't like. She's a critical resource to this multi-billion dollar organization globally. And now he's going to lose the, his job, the manager. So what we can't do is we cannot afford these negative management um, styles any longer. What do we do? We must replace this by coaching-based performance management and performance uh, management practices. So what we, this is, this is actually a great picture because when we have a coach and the coach is now a conductor of one person singing with a band of people as colleagues, we have the right approach because this person plays a critical role to that individual who's the leading uh, a guitarist or violin player uh, or singer behind the background of, uh, of, a, of an orchestra. And the coach is now responsible to, to bring out the best in the person in a supportive, but also in a directive manner that, that, that the individual can, can experience that the coach is doing it for me. The coach makes, makes the job for me easier and I can feel, I can experience success and, and workplace success as a result of the coaching practices. This is gone. We can't, we can't go with this uh, shout and scream and force people to do what we want them to do any longer. It's over. It's that, those times are over. It's, it's gone. We can't do it. What, what will happen is if this individual that's been shouted and screamed out is a, is, a, is a critical resource for the company, we might just lose the person and, and, and we create a lot of negative energy. It's, it's just not a sustainable practice in business. So the point is, how do we do this? How do we do all of this? Um, where do we start? This, it looks like such an enormous job from an HR perspective and from a human resource management perspective to do these things and to put it in place and to make it a, a business practice where we are, uh, where we have the responsibility to manage the energy of our people employed. Well, let me show you. Shadow Match can do a few things. We have four areas uh, knowledge, skills, behavior development, and performance development. In, on the knowledge level, what Shadamash can do is we can help the individual with what to study. Let's say somebody wants to study something to improve their success in the workplace. The question is, what should they study? What will benefit their future career in that business best? This, the, 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 the career report create, uh, generated by Shadamash is the perfect framework to help the individual discover what should I study to further and to, uh, to support my career going into the future. Even despite the fact that I'm with this company, what should I study? So the career report provides you with a platform to discuss that question and to come to a very definitive answer. How to study if this adult employee starts to go on an academic journey. We provide them with a study method report that is age sensitive for adults who would like to be successful with their academic uh, careers. Keep in mind that once you have left university or, or college or, or school even, uh, the, the, the fact that you wanna study doesn't mean that you can study. You've, you've now been out of it for 10 years. Where do we start? And how do we study? We forgot these, these practices of, of studying right through the night. On a skills level, skills grid, the system that is the, 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 the partner system of Shadow Match, um, we can do skills audits in the business, skills development, gap analysis can be done, critical performance skills audits can be done, and it's an automated system. We can do it almost, it's we can almost say we can do it instantaneously, but it's not, it's because people are just not able to do the, 
to answer the questions all in one day, some are on leave, but it's an automated process. It can be done very quickly, very efficiently without the loss of critical time. And we can immediately identify what skills do we need to develop in what areas of the business as applicable to each individual, because we cannot do the blanket approach of skills development because people do not have a blanket gap in their skills. Uh, we must do it very individualized and very specific so that we develop people against the skills that are critical and the skills that they lack. So that's, a, that's what skills grid can do for a company. Shadow match obviously as the engine uh, for optimal placement. Remember in the previous, 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 previous slide, we said that poor performance in the workplace is actually a function of poor recruitment practices. We recruit the wrong people and then they are poor performers, poor performers and then we try to manage the problem. So um, it's, if the person is not a good match to the environment, we cannot performance management then to, to fix and address the problem. Optimal placement is the first thing that Shadow Match does, personal development programs, we'll talk about that. We can have unique development programs, purpose-driven development programs that we can coach the individual to acquire specific behaviors for them that are necessary for the environment, specific habits that can be developed. And then team optimization, how do we function as a team? We have the full capability to do team optimization and, and how to make people successful as a working team. And then obviously we have the entire wellness, the personal wellness framework that helps with the behavior of the individual in the workplace. And then on a performance level, um, remember what we said is there's a shift from hard manager to subordinate performance management to coach-based performance management. So what companies should be doing and the great way going into the future and the current frame that we are in as, 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 as a global community is that we rather coach people than force manage them into, into success. So we have a coaching platform. There are, there's a specific dedicated career coaching program in the system that helps an individual to, to, to move forward and to be more successful with their careers in, in a specific company. There are 20 unique personal development programs to develop a specific behavior that is necessary for a specific job that they might lack. And then there is fulfillment coaching for those individuals who struggle in the workplace just because they, the, the, some of the areas in their, in their lives are not fully in place. And they need to bring a, a few things together and leave a th few things behind so that they do not spend too much energy on the frustrations of life. Uh, and, and that could free their, their, their brain and their, their energy levels to be more successful in the workplace. And with that, if you have, if you would like to see how Shadow Match does all of the above, what you can do is contact, contact your Shadow Match consultant, or you can send an email to the Shadow Match head office, info at shadowmatch.com. And if you need external coaches to help you with the performance coaching of employees in the workplace, you can go to shadowmatchcoaches.com. We have more than 100 active trained coaches on the system. Uh, many of them are visible on our coaching uh, coaches uh, website. Some of them have obviously selected not to be visible on the site because either they have already, they have reached capacity or whatever the reason might be. Uh, but you have all the information available there. And if, if you want more information on the Shadow Match engine, you can go to shadowmatch.com. Uh, that's our library of information if you need that. With that, Lizette, I'm going to hand back to you and hear for questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, some comments. Thank you very much for very good content, very insightful content. Everybody enjoyed it. There were some questions and comments in the chat. I just want to remind you that the recording will be available tomorrow on the Shadow Match calendar. 
Those of you that have not seen it before, you go to www.shadowmatch.com and in the top section, there's a tab events 2022. That's the Shadow Match events calendar and the recording will be available and you are welcome to share that recording with anyone. So it's not um, exclusively to the people that have attended today. It will be available to anyone and you can share it. And then just a reminder that on our YouTube channel, there's a library of resources of all the webinars that we've presented um, in the past two years. There's a, 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 a hell of a list of, of recordings that you can listen and you're also welcome to share those with people and all the all the webinars we hosted um, this year, 2022, those recordings are available on the calendar. Um, there were some comments, Peter. Just one question that I would like you to comment on before I open the floor for other people to ask their questions. Um, Lana made a comment and she said, um, the fact that people don't read anymore and that there's a decline specifically um, in people that still read efficiently and with, uh, with memory, does this make the requirement for automation even higher? Um, Lizette, it's a huge problem. And all the sort of the academic and, 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 and business leaders are very frustrated with this decline in reading. Now, the fact that the question came in, I want to share my screen again and show you another slide where I just captured something and I was, I was sort of, I anticipated this as a question that might come in. I wanna show you something that research have shown. 17 year old reading in 1984, there was a study done and they have found that the green number there are 17 year olds, 31%, reading almost every day. In 2012, they repeated this, the 31% shrunk to 19%. That's more than a third down. It's 35% down on 17 year olds that read almost every day. But what, what the, the, the scary part is the red number, that red part there is, never or hardly ever read, 17 years old, 2012, 27%. And in 1984, that number was only 9% who are hardly ever read. So this picture is, it's a horrible picture about the global status of reading. And then most students uh, read, read less than 15 minutes per day. This is an indication of the 2012 breakdown of information, where 54% reads more than less than 15 minutes a day. Uh, now that's up to zero, up to 15 minutes. But this 18% more than 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 eight, uh, 30 minutes a day is also has also declined hugely over the years. So the question is, what do we do? The fact that we automate things is because of our own doing. Um, I have, I've seen this and I have said it, and I have said it again and again. What business leaders will do is they will increasingly find it difficult to get people with the capability to read, understand and execute. And what they will say is, I will automate this. Let's go. Let's Let's build a robot, let's build a system let, that can do this. And this is one of the underlying motivational uh, drives to, for, for the fourth industrial revolution to rather automate because an automated system will always be able to read so, um, and, and to execute the task. So this, this, and we do not know how to turn this thing around. Uh, it, it seems to be almost an impossible thing to do. Uh, we don't know the, the, the intellectuals and the research uh, universities and business leaders and technology leaders and psychologists and, 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 and the education system doesn't help us. It's a, it's a parenting then. Parents, we must start from the bottom again. So it's a, it's a huge challenge and, and it's a challenge that will influence the workplace uh, 
in a, in a very negative way going into the future. But but we don't know how to deal with it. But automation will drive this. This will drive automation even further into the red line. Thanks, Lizzie. Thanks, Peter. There were some um, comments and some suggestions with regards to the shadow match reports. Those of you that followed, um, just from our side to mention that we um, are in the process of looking at doing a bullet point for the full report. And you would know that already the career report and the study report um, is an interact they, they, those are interactive reports with videos and graphs. So if somebody doesn't read, at least they can watch the video and watch their graph and then maybe scan through the, the content. Um, we are also looking at in the future um, to incorporate a reader so that somebody can have the report read to them whilst they drive their car or whilst they sit in front of the TV or whilst they have a cup of coffee. So please don't hold us to timelines, but those are things that we are currently investigating because of this um, decline in reading. So from my side, what I would do now is I'm going to enable the setting so that you can unmute yourselves. I see Paul has raised his hand. So Paul, you're welcome to go first. Um, I will record these questions just so that those that have to leave can also follow the discussion. Um, thank you, Paul. You're welcome. Hi, Peter. Thanks for the presentation. Just a question. Uh, just back to those graphs. I was my reading has probably done the opposite of that since 1984 when I finished matric, but that that's a personal issue. But but what I find I do more does uh, nowadays is audiobooks. Now I presume the neural pathways and the habits are different when it comes to actually sitting down and reading compared to listening to an audiobook. Is there any because I sometimes one doesn't have the time to sit down and read, but you you listen to an audiobook a couple of times. Just that'll be interesting to hear your comments on that. Um, Paul, this is a very tough question, brother. Um, because what what happens is we actually we help the process of non-reading by publishing audiobooks this the, the the brain does different things when we read than when when we hear now if you and i don't you might not have children between the age of birth and seven years but i'm doing the the, the, the community webinar very soon on the, on the development of that first seven years. When we read and we hear and we see pictures, the brain combines the information in a much more efficient and effective manner than when we only hear it, only see it, or only read it. Now, the most challenging of all these activities are reading. Reading is a very difficult thing for the brain to do. And we are now in a position where the scientists understand what happens in the brain. What the brain does, Paul, is when you read something, it creates pictures on the fly of what you read. It, it turns the ideas into pictures in the brain because the pictures are much easier for the brain to work with. And that is the ability that we lose. When we hear, when we listen to somebody, because the, 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 the practice of storytelling is thousands of years older than the practice of reading. So the brain is much more competent and capable of taking what we hear and turn that into pictures because our mothers and fathers and the community have told us stories since we were very, very small. So we, what we, it's easy for the brain to take what we hear and turn that into pictures because the pictures we remember. But if you read, it's tough for the brain to do it. It's extremely difficult to turn the content into working pictures in the brain so that we can understand and work with it. And that is what we lose. So the more we listen to audiobooks, obviously the more we compromise our ability to be, to be competent and capable of reading. And reading is by far the, the, the most powerful way of communicating globally for, for, and it has been for many years, but now suddenly we, we experience that it, it doesn't work anymore. We, people don't read, Paul. And it's the reason for that is they cannot read. It's just too, it's, it's, a, it's a bridge too far for them. The brain has lost the ability to put the content together. Uh, as they read it. So, 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 so audiobooks 
we fill the gaps of time and it's an, it's an efficient way, but it compromises our reading capability. There's no question about it. Good, it's a good question, very good question. Thanks, Lizzie. Thanks, Peter. Just can I just add something on your performance management? The performance management is excellent for companies that still want to see what the progress of people are doing because they want to see has the person gone through their development plan and it's a wonderful way of giving a tangible feedback and a lot of people who I use it uh, actually like that aspect to say oh we can put it into their performance plan we can see that they did complete the development plan so that's just a compliment on, on how the tool can be used in performance management. Um, Lizette, sorry, before we, we go to the next question, Paul, that's exactly what we want. We want a system and we want a performance management framework that we can track the progress, we can show what we have done, we can prove to the company what the progress is, and if there is no progress, we actually have a tool that we can work with uh, as an alternative for the individual if it really doesn't work. It's a very good comment. Thank you very much for that. Thanks, Lizette. Thanks, Peter. I guess Marilda's got a question because she switched on her video. But Marilda, before I get to you, I just want to position a question that came in the chat. The fact that people don't read, um, does this not speak to the habit of conceptual fitness um, and the development thereof? So, Peter, the, the fact that conceptual fitness might not be high if you look at the Shadowmaster result, is that uh, a direct result of the decline in reading or how would you position that? Now, without question, Lizette, um, the, the problem is that when we position complicated content to people as reading content, we are in decline of the ability to put those, those concepts together and come to a solution. So there's no question about it that it talks to the ability of people to conceptualize reading content. But the, the, the challenge, Lizette, is we are not out of the reading demand as yet. People must be able to read. Um, they must be able to take the reading material that's been given to them. If you look at contracts, for instance, uh, people do not read contracts. And it's not that they don't want to, they can't read it. It's their brain networks and their neuron paths are not wired to read those complicated content and put it together in, 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 in concepts that they can understand. But we must, if we want to, if we want to make progress in the workplace, we must have the ability to read these complex content and put it together and find a solution to what we have read. And whether, you know, that's it. And if you can't read, you can't read. That's it. It's a problem, but it compromises your ability to solve problems. Yeah, it's, it, it talks to the problem. It's very well spotted. Thanks. Thanks, Marilda. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I actually feel like we have a responsibility not to let people not read. Um, I find that I actually start forcing people to slow down because people are so used to going through things quickly that they miss a lot of stuff. And yes, it is one of my biggest frustrations having to take a couple of steps back because just this morning I had the same thing. I had people going, oh, I see this report, but no, I don't agree. And then I'd be like, okay, so let's just talk about that a little bit. And then the example that's given back is exactly what the shadow match report says. And I'm like, what? <laughs> it's what it says here. Okay, okay, let's take a couple of steps back and go through it again. And I find that I get frustrated because people don't read properly. And so that's an interesting thing for me because I feel that if we help people if we enable them to not read properly and to not stop and dig in a little deeper we are um, allowing this scourge to get even worse so i'm saying that we have a, a very careful balance that we have to to run where we have to stay with the industry for and whatever new developments are happening but we cannot let such a critical skill um, get lazy because of the environment and the society, because then we're not helping the issue. Um, Lizette, can I comment on that? Um, Marilda, this is, this is a crisis, um, and it's not a crisis for, for, for now, it's a crisis for generations to come, because parents do not teach their children to read anymore. Uh, the schooling system has become such a picture and screen based system that they don't learn how to read anymore. So what we what we must just 
change our wording as a first step. And that is, we mustn't say people don't read. We must say people can't read because we are in the process where people lose their ability to take a shadow match report, read and understand it. And this is something that we experience on a global level where people come to, the, to, to their coach, to their consultant, to their mentor, to, their, to whoever they, 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 they can approach, to their parents and say, help me with this report. Have you read it? Yes, I've read it. What does it say? I don't know. And that is what we get. And, 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 and what, we, what we are working towards, unless we turn the tide, is an in illiterate global population, people who can't read. If you don't show them pictures, there was in my research, there was, a, there was a, a, an artist who drew a picture of uh, 20,000 years ago. We, we have these pictures on the, on the stones that we communicated with one another. And we had books then in between. And now we are with emojis again, where we communicate with one another. This is a huge problem because it compromises the entire intellectual capability of the planet on a collective uh, level and and uh, the 22 27 people that we have now on the screen uh, will not change this we can't change it but we can we can sort of work with the knowledge that people will will need support in the reading of of, of advanced material so so i hear what you say the problem is i don't know how to fix it thanks lizzie Thanks. I'll allow one last question and then I'm going to stop the recording. Um, after the recording, I'll allow more questions, but I don't want the recording to run for too long over the hour. So let's see. Is there any last question? I see Svelele, you switched on your video. Would you like to ask a question? Um, you must just unmute if you want to ask the question because we can't hear you. Of course. Thank you. Thank you. I got that. Um, I um, just want. I just want to clarify: Is Shadowmatch a uh, partner with the uh, DMC, or is it that they just temporarily use their services for a particular course, and then that's just it? Um, I didn't. I didn't get the entire question. We uh, Shadowmatch um, is a standalone system. So I'm not mm. sure whether you, what partner you are referring to. Shadow Match is a standalone system. It's researched and developed in South Africa. So, um, and the career report, study report, all the reports um, and all the coaching systems um, are part of the Shadow Match system. So I'm not sure that I'm understanding the question. Maybe you can just repeat. Sure, no, of course. Um, I was just asking if Shadow Match is a partner with DMC, do you recall DMC, the call center? Um, I think it? we've got many clients. So if DMC is one of the clients that you are referring to, then probably yes, then that's one of our Shadow Match clients. And then you can just contact the consultant that is working with DMC. Um, I'm going to ask Shamain to just check on the system, who's the consultant for DMC, and we can ask the, that consultant to get hold of you. Um, with more questions that you might have. I, I, I trust that that will, that will help to answer and to address your questions. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. Thank you. Lise, just from my side, Svelele, what you can do is just drop us your email in the chat so that we can make contact with you directly by email because uh, we might not have your email address. Just give us your email in the chat um, and, and, and send, it, send it to uh, Shadow Match office so that we just have a connection with you directly so that we can answer your question in more detail when uh, tomorrow or whenever. Great, thank you very much. We'll do that. You can just, um, or you can just send us an email Svelile, to info at shadowmatch.com and we can pick up that email and we can get you in contact with your Shadow Match consultant. Dear participants, I'm going to end the recording now. You're welcome to stay on, ask a few more questions, should there be questions. But thank you very much for joining, and we look forward to seeing you at our next webinar.